In this session, we're going to be looking at the goals of Christian education. So just a reminder, we've been going through the triangle of necessary and sufficient conditions, talking about the fact that Christian education involves a distinct standard. That is, the Bible tells us what is right and wrong. The Bible tells us how we should educate children. We've looked at the motive of Christian education. That is, that we work out of a motive of love. That's our heart attitude. And now we're going to look at the goal or the outcome of Christian education, that that is a distinctive outcome as well. So first, let's think about the overall goals that we should have. First of all, our primary goal is that we should do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So that should be our primary goal in all that we do in Christian education, is to glorify God. Another overall goal is the advance of the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So that should be our outcome. That should be what we desire to see happen, is the advance of the kingdom of Christ. But then beyond this, we have the goals of seeing students who demonstrate certain things. We, we want to see changes in the students. You know, there have been uh, concerns in the past decades about outcome-based education, the idea that schools are trying to change the children. Well, we are trying to change the children. Uh, we don't want children to stay the way they are when they come to us and so we want to see them changed but here's how we want to see them changed we want students who are going to follow the proper standard that is they're going to obey the Lord God they are going to follow his word we want students who are going to have the right motive students who will love the Lord their God with all their heart soul mind and strength and who will love their neighbor as themselves and we want students who will seek the right goals. That is, we want students who will also seek to glorify God and to advance the kingdom of Christ. So these are our overall kind of big picture goals that we look at in Christian education. Now at Cherokee Christian School, we have some specific goals. This is our mission statement. Okay, that's where we get these goals from. And so we have, as the first part of our mission statement, we say that we are glorifying God. So that's, again, the overall picture, but here's how we do it at Cherokee Christian School. We assist parents, we provide a Christ-centered education, and an academically excellent education. We edify the whole child with godly leadership through service. So let's look at those points particularly, so we can see how they apply to us at Cherokee Christian School. We assist parents first. That's one of our goals. That's one of the things we work for is assisting parents. After all, parents are given the responsibility for the education of their children. Deuteronomy 6 says that parents, especially fathers, are to teach God's word diligently to the children when they sit in the house, when they walk by the way, when they lie down, when they rise up. So Christian education and Christian nurture of children is a parental responsibility. However, the fact that it's a parental responsibility does not imply that parents must do it. Okay? The fact that they're responsible for it doesn't mean that they actually have to do it. It's similar to the fact that parents are responsible to feed their children. They have to provide food for their children, but that doesn't mean parents need to have a garden and to grow all the food. Parents can go out and buy the food. They can go to Kroger, they can go to Ingalls, they can go to Aldi, whatever, and they can buy the food for their children. They're still carrying out their responsibility. It's just that they are paying somebody else to actually grow the food and process it, and then the parents are just providing it for their children that way. And likewise, parents don't have to educate their children. They have to see that they are educated. And so where we come into the picture is that parents are hiring us to carry out their responsibility, to help them with their job. Uh, parents are essentially saying, I think you're better at teaching children than I am, at least in these areas, and so I want to pay you to do it. It's an issue of the division of labor. Now, this does not mean that the parents run the school. There are some areas where there are parent-run schools, officially, where the parents are 
actually in charge of the school. Uh, this works when you're in a community where everybody is basically on the same page. Uh, some Christian Reformed communities in the Midwest uh, work this way, uh, where uh, all the parents in the school go to the same church or go to a few churches. They all have a common understanding of Christian education, and so they are able to come together to make decisions about the school. In most areas of the country, though, this isn't the case. And so uh, our parents don't run the school any more than parents run the grocery store. You know, you go to the uh, store, and if you don't like something, you can tell the manager about it, you can complain about it, or you can go somewhere else. Or you can just kind of say, well, I don't like this, but I like everything else about the store, so I'll keep coming. Uh, and in a sense, you have control over the store, because if enough people are dissatisfied, then the store is going to lose business. Uh, so it's the same way at the Christian school. Uh, Parents don't run the school, but if enough of them become dissatisfied with what we're doing, they're going to leave and we'll go out of business. And so we need to be sensitive to their concerns. But what this means is we need to have communication between home and school. Teachers need to communicate with parents. Parents need to communicate with the uh, teachers and let everybody know what's going on. So this is the first part of our idea of assisting parents, of our mission. The second part, we can go over real quickly because that's what this whole seminar is about anyway, is Christ-centered education. Uh, we have an education that has a distinctive curriculum uh, where we use distinctively Christian methods and we have a distinctively Christian discipline. Now, another part of our mission is that we provide academically excellent education. Uh, at Cherokee Christian School, that means it's a college preparatory program. Uh, not all Christian schools need to be college preparatory. There are schools that say they're designed for learning disabled students or they're designed for vocational preparation. That's fine. There's nothing more biblical about college prep than there is about others. It's just that we don't have the facilities or the uh, resources to carry out a broad range of education, so we focus on a college preparatory education. But that's what we're after, to prepare the students for college. And that's not only preparing the students to get into college. That's actually not too hard, is to prepare them to get into college to meet the standards for acceptance. But we want to prepare the students to succeed once they're in college. We want to give them the tools that they need in their intellectual toolbox to succeed, to do well in college. Now we want our students to understand the times. I take this from 1 Chronicles 12.32 where we read about the sons of Issachar. It says that they understood the times with knowledge of what Israel ought to do. And so we need to understand our times. We need to think about what our culture is like and what our students need if they're going to go into this world. So that's part of our academically excellent education. So we want to pursue excellence. It's a matter of holding the bar high, of raising the bar high, and working hard to achieve that. Uh, sometimes people don't like the idea of excellence, especially when it becomes difficult. Uh, but uh, that's our goal, is to have an excellent education. Now the next part of our mission statement says that we're here to edify the whole child. And one helpful way of understanding what it means to deal with the whole child is found in Luke 2.52, where we're told that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. And so the, we can see this. It's helpful to use this. I'm not going to say that this is uh, the, prop, the uh, full exegesis of this text, but it does give us kind of an idea of a fourfold way of looking at child development. Uh, because it's talking about how Jesus grew. So it says that he grew in wisdom. And we can equate this with academic development. Uh, I know that biblically wisdom is much more than academic development. But in this scheme, let's look at it this way. That wisdom here refers to academic development. That is, we want our students to grow intellectually. But Jesus also grew in stature. And this would refer to physical development. So we want to deal with our students and to teach them uh, and cause them to grow physically. 
We want our students to grow in favor with God, as Jesus did. This would be spiritual development. We want them to learn to love God and to follow Him, and in favor with men. It is social development. So this this fourfold approach here helps us see how we should be training our children and dealing with the whole child. We're not just training brains, academic development. We're not a basketball oriented or sports oriented school. That would be the physical development only. The school needs to deal with all four of these areas. And then finally our mission statement says that we are developing godly leadership through service. Leadership through service. This is what true leadership is all about. Jesus said that uh, he who would be first among you shall be last and shall be servant of all. The way that we serve others, or as we serve others, we find that we rise to positions of leadership. Think about this just in the business world, for example. You find that successful businesses on the whole are those that do the best job of serving their customers, of meeting the needs of their customers. The best employees, uh, the ones uh, who rise to positions of leadership, are those who best meet the needs of those around them. So this is what true leadership is, is godly leadership through service. And so we want our students to uh, develop leadership that's based on service, first of all to God, and then service to others. And there are several ways that we carry this out at the school. We have formal things that help develop this. We require our high school students to uh, engage in a certain number of service hours uh, before they graduate. We have instruction in Bible class about service. Uh, and there might be instruction in other class subjects as well, and we can take students on field trips or mission trips uh, to teach them about the whole idea of service. Informally, we might teach our students about service through modeling, as the teacher is involved in serving, not only serving the students, but serving others. Uh, the students are going to learn to be of service as well. And as the teachers uh, disciple, students as they just deal with an informal uh, personal discipleship. They will be able to help the students develop in their leadership. Now that's our school mission statement. There are some other things that we look for that are not presented in our mission statement but some outcomes that we would like to see. One of these is the gospel itself, presenting the gospel. Now CCS is not an evangelistic school. That is we're not designed as a school to seek to win the lost. That's not our primary goal. There are schools that are like that. For example, uh, Pensacola Christian School, where we get our uh, some of our curriculum materials, the Becca materials, they are explicitly an evangelistic school. I have been to seminars there. They say that what they are after is to have an education that will attract unbelievers to come so that they can present the gospel to them. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that what we do is better. It's just that that's not what we are after here. Uh, it's fine if you and if you want to be very consistent and think through, okay, how can we attract unbelievers so that we can present the gospel? And that's fine. There's no problem there. But that's not what CCS is. We are more of what's called a covenant school. That is, we expect at least one parent to be a professing believer. Uh, so that we can say that we're working on the same page with them. Now, as we have talked before, we find that there are a lot of different pages that even professing believers look at. But uh, at least we want the parents to have somewhat of the same commitment that we do to the Word of God. So, this fact is, though, that there are still going to be unbelieving students here. Uh, whether they are uh, young or old, there are going to be students here who have not come to saving faith. And so we need to present the gospel. We can do this formally. We can have in our Bible classes times when we very explicitly go over what the gospel is. Uh, you have devotions with your students. Uh, you have chapel messages. In all these ways, there are, you can present the gospel to the students and call them to faith in Christ. But you can also do it informally, just as the teacher deals with a particular student outside of class, she might present the gospel to them and realize, you know, this student just really doesn't know Christ. 
so she can present the gospel. Or it might be in the context of other instruction, maybe as you're talking about history and you're looking at some particular historical figures, you might end up presenting the gospel that way. So presenting the gospel is one of the things, one of the outcomes that we see at Cherokee Christian School. Another is inculcating a biblical worldview. Now we've talked about the biblical worldview uh, in our first session. We went over a biblical philosophy. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we can do this both formally and informally. That is, formally, we have a worldviews class for our high school seniors and uh, in other subjects, in other grade levels. Teachers will teach on the worldview of that subject. They might present, okay, here's a biblical view of revolution as you deal with the uh, war for independence or other subjects so that they present the students with a biblical worldview. But you can also do it informally as you're just talking with the students or as subjects come up in class, you can bring a biblical worldview to bear on it. And also it can be your unspoken framework of life. You see, as you just live out the Christian life and you show the students how, for example, you're not watching some of the same movies they are uh, or listening to the same music that they are, not because you're older, but because it's like, okay, this is not edifying. You're able to present things. And you're able to help the students start seeing a biblical view. And then another outcome we want is that the students will develop Christ-like character. We want them to be like Jesus. And again, we can do this formally and informally. Formally, we have preventative discipline and reactive discipline. Preventative discipline, you do things that will train the students and will disciple the students so that they behave and act more like Christ. Reactive discipline, they misbehave, you deal with them, but again, you want them to become more like Christ. You're pointing them to Christ. Informally, the students see your example of life. They see how you live as a Christian. And so uh, this is going to help them likewise to develop Christ-like character. And then you may, you'll have informal discussions outside of class or at other times, uh, helping them to see what it is like to be a biblical Christian. So these are some of the outcomes, some of the goals that we are looking for at Cherokee Christian Schools. Uh, we have a distinctive goal for our work here. Now, in the notes section of your iTunes U notebook, I'd like for you to give some thought. Again, this is just for your own purpose, but give some thought and jot down some ideas. Which of these goals do you struggle with the most in the classroom? Maybe you struggle with the idea of assisting parents. Maybe that's hard for you. Or maybe you struggle with educating the whole child. You tend to focus just on the intellectual aspect. But think about which goals you might struggle with the most and any ideas you might have just for your own use of things you might try out to do this. So then in our last session, uh, in the next session, which will be our last one, we'll be looking at various specific educational issues as we apply a Christian worldview to them.